The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, hello everybody, welcome to Econ 101. Oh, that fell flat. <laughs> uh, this is intro to module development in Drupal 6 with um, whatever modifications need to be made to adapt the things I'm showing to Drupal 7. Um, despite, well, there are quite a few things that have changed from 6 to 7, but a lot of the things that we go over are relatively simple changes. The, the largest differences between 6 and 7 are session management and the database management, not, neither of which we're going to be touching. Uh, that said, this, this um, session's not about the details of the API. I'm trying to give you an overview in the direction um, and where you need to look to find uh, what you need to do to get started. This is basically um, one of the hardest things to do when you're getting started with a new development project or a new framework is finding out where all the pieces are and how they all fit together. So uh, first we're going to define a module. How many uh, of you guys already use Drupal? Everybody? Are you guys uh, comfortable installing modules yourself? Then we use Drush to install them for themselves? Has anybody tried to write a module themselves? Oh, we got one. <laughs> All right, I just wanted to get an idea. All right, so uh, what is a module? Some examples that you guys might have come across, CCK provides the content uh, fields, views, which allows you to display content, automatic node titles, et cetera, caption, menu blocks. These are examples of modules you'll find in the contrib. We're gonna talk a little bit about how they are put together. Um, so modules are the building blocks that give Drupal the flexibility and power. If that's not a good enough explanation to you. A module is a collection of hooks and API calls that act together to extend or modify core functionality. Everybody on board? <laughs> All right, well, what are hooks and API calls? Um, API calls you'll be familiar with when you're working with anything else in any other framework. They're basically the functions that the framework provides to you. I'll go over a few of them later. The important thing to learn with Drupal is the hook system. If you're familiar with design patterns, a bit, it's a bit like the, the listener pattern. What you do is you set up a function that is going to be called on certain um, occasions. That is to say, when a page is loaded, there's a function hook for page load. When a user logs in, there's a function hook for the user login. So when Drupal processes the request for a page, it says, hey, anybody interested in processing the page load? Anybody interested in processing the user login? So here are some examples of built-in hooks uh, that you're gonna use on virtually every module that you develop. Hook menu, which allows you to create um, menu callbacks, that is to say, if someone were to go to slash my custom page, you would add a callback to the hook menu saying, I wanna add my custom page uh, to the request queue. That is to say, if somebody requests my custom page, call my function. Hook form alter lets you modify forms before they're displayed. Hook block lets you uh, create, display, and edit existing blocks. Hook user lets you keep track of user login, log out, creation, deletion. And uh, hook node API uh, keeps track of node creation, deletion. Now, because it's such an important concept, does everybody understand what a hook is? No? All right. Um, there's this old metaphor. I, I'm not sure how well it communicates, but um, when you're delivering mail via train, they have these hooks that are on the side of the train. And as the train goes by the station, they have these hooks at various heights, depending upon whether or not it's picking up or delivering mail. So if the station wants to pick up mail from a particular location, they set the hook at this height. And if they want to deliver mail, they'll set a hook at another height. So when they're ready to deliver mail, they just hang their mail bag on that hook. And when the train flies by, the hook on the train catches it and it gets deposited into a part of the train. The corollary here is, as a Drupal developer, you're acting as the station dealing with the train. You're trying to anticipate actions that the train is going to be taking, and you want to um, prepare your mailbag or your content for when the train stops by. So those um, examples of what a, a hook might be 
are, for example, when you go to a Drupal website and load the front page, behind the scenes, there is a module, say, the node module, that will uh, figure out what node that you're trying to look at and call hook node with that information. So you're creating that function and it's being called. Um, let me back up a little bit and say these are not functions as such. There is no hook underscore menu function. The hook part is created by you. So if we're creating a module and we're going to create one called hello, then your implementation of hook menu is going to be hello underscore menu. Drupal uh, parses your um, source files, finds these functions by this magic naming scheme, and calls them automatically. So um, is that kind of getting the idea across? Because I can go some more. Yeah. And um, we'll revisit it again, I think, after I do a little bit of the module development. So this is the first opportunity where I can show you some differences between Drupal 6 and 7. And 6, these are the functions that you'd be using. The, one of the issues that they're trying to address in 7 with the new um, hook system is that hook node API is called whether the node is being created, deleted, inserted, destroyed, etc. So it seems like an awful lot of work for a single hook um, instance to be handling. So what they've done, oh, I started with user, of course. Same with the hook user. Normally these are passes, uh, parameters to the, your, your callback function. Now in Drupal 7, they've all been forced, uh, parsed down into their own separate functions. All right, so I'll go into an implementation of them. So we do the same thing with node API. And we do the same thing with node block, or hook block. So here's an example of a workflow where you would actually define some hook callbacks. Say we're building a user login form, or Drupal is about to build the user login form, and it's going to call uh, hook login. And it's going to say, does anybody want to take a look at the form that's being passed? Well, hook form alter, really. Does anybody want to take a look at the form? CCK has no response, doesn't care. Views doesn't interact with that hook, so there's no uh, definition in there. Login toboggan, it wants to add a, a, a login using your email address a piece of information and it wants to add a callback to verify that the email address was valid. So in this case, login toboggan will implement hook lo uh, form alter on the login form, wait for that to be called, modify the form to add the missing pieces that it wants to add, and then send it back on its way. Open ID. Um, yeah, it also responds. Links to add, please. It's a little known fact that OpenID speaks lolcat. All right, so that's the example of hooks that we are going to be using. There's also a, an API as part of the framework. Here's a couple of examples of API functions. Within Drupal, you can use the T function to localize text. So if you have a piece of text that you'd want to be translated in the user's language, you'd pass it through the T function. It's not the only thing it does. It also sanitizes the text to some extent. So it's always a good idea to pass it through the T function for future um, compatibility. There are also things that allow you to hook. Uh, there are hooks that are called when the T function is called. So that means that in the future, should you ever want to modify all text that passes through the T function, you'll be able to catch that hook and modify that text. So uh, L is another function. It sanitizes links and does uh, aliases. Anybody familiar with the path auto module? What that function module does is it takes node slash 26 and creates an alias. And um, now that you know that there's a hook for menu, you can probably get an idea of how that might come into play. Um, for loading and saving nodes, there's node load and node save. Those work slightly different in V7 versus V6. Uh, and Drupal doesn't encourage the export of HTML directly to pages. Uh, you generally want to pass, say, list elements or table function, table content, or uh, anything that needs to be structured through the theme function. And there are sub-functions for list, uh, grid, table, etc. The reason you'd want to do this is that it allows the theme layer to um, interpret that list any way it wants. So it can create an accordion, a um, a drop-down list, a slide-out, it can do whatever wacky thing it needs to, where you, and you don't have to update any of your code to uh, benefit from that. Um, Drupal set message gives you those little pop-up messages that you see. It'll give you the um, notice, warning, or error messages that you see throughout the site. 
and uh, user load and user save allow you to um, load and save user um, accounts. So you can change email addresses, usernames, et cetera. Uh, in terms of checking whether or not somebody has access to do this, you guys are familiar with the role system within Drupal. User access is a function that you pass a user and a permission or a role, and it'll tell you whether or not that user has access. Um, there is a reason I'm going through these in particular. We're going to be using them. Uh, for creating forms, Drupal, again, takes the ability to spit out HTML directly away from you. You have to generate these nested form arrays. I'll give you an example of one later. The reason they do it with nested, form or nested arrays is that um, when a form is generated, several hooks get access to modify that form. And so they can add an element to the array, take elements out of the array, or move things around. Before the, uh, function, uh, before the form is finally displayed to the user, it's a um, hash key is generated. Uh, based on the elements that are present in the form. And the reason they do that is that if the form is ever um, cross-site posted or modified in the browser before being posted, the hash will fail and it'll, the form will fail. So it's an, a layer of security. So uh, here's the obligatory um, structure diagram of how Drupal um, and various elements work together. And here is a list of the hooks that are available in core. Uh, various contrib modules provide their own hooks in addition to these. So um, to get an idea of how many you have available to you, lots. If you want to see the full list, you can try, go to um, this URL. This presentation is available on prezi.com if you search for um, Drupal 6 Rapid Module Development and the name of this conference, it'll be there. So let's go ahead and talk about how we build an example module. What we're going to do is we're going to make a module that when you log in, it will say, hello, username. And uh, we'll also create a block that says, you have been logged in for X number of minutes and seconds. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm rushing through things. I want to be able to do the actual module development. And this presentation can go a little long. All right. So one of the things that we want to be able to do is uh, we want to have a settings form so that you can change what message appears when the user logs in. So we're going to have our settings for it at, say, admin slash settings slash hello. In order to create the form that appears when you go to that URL, we're going to create an implementation of the hook menu hook. Then we want to make sure that the person accessing that form has permission to do so. So we're going to create a permission. The way we do that is we uh, create an instance of the hook perm permission, or uh, hook callback, define the permissions that we want to be able to be accessible. The user, the administrator assigns those permissions, and then they'll have access to those menu entries. Uh, well, user access. That's how they would, we would check it in code. So next up, hook user. Um, given what you know about hook user, why, why would we want to write an implementation of that? Not everybody at once. <laughs> so you're going to identify who's trying to access it. Uh, this is the function that's called when somebody logs in. So uh, your implementation of hook user is going to be called when anybody logs in. So when, when it gets called, you're going to say, um, is this user supposed to receive this message? And in our case, everybody does. We'll go ahead and do the Drupal set message from our implementation of hook user, um, as indicated here. Uh, now, I said also that this module is going to create a block that displays the amount of time that you've been logged in. We're, how we're going to do that is we're going to use hook block in a number of different ways. In Drupal 6, we would catch the um, info operation, which tells Drupal how, what blocks we're creating and um, any of the metadata associated with it, like a title, a description, um, whether or not to cache the results, et cetera. It will also catch the uh, view uh, operation. And that's what happens when Drupal actually wants to display the block. It calls your view callback. Now, in Drupal 7, it's a little different. You'd implement two different hooks. It'd be hook block uh, info and hook block view. Uh, this is a good time to talk about um, how data is passed around in Drupal. There's a good mix of uh, nested arrays and objects in Drupal 6. In Drupal 7, there's a lot more on the object side. But they're generally large objects that are passed around by reference. 
the form array form is passed as an array for the reasons I specified earlier. It's going to be passed from one hook to another being modified. So things like login toboggan can add their login at, with your email address. Open ID can add the little links at the bottom. Uh, account is, well, user is the user object, which contains the logged in user for this particular request. Uh, it also contains, if there's a content profile, usually node the node um, fields related to it. Uh, the time they were last logged in, which is going to be useful to us in this module. There's also um, a convention that if you're modifying a user and it's not the active user, that you use the account uh, variable. The reason you do that is just make the code easier to read. And uh, node is um, typically the active node, and it's a large, very large um, object. Oh, I didn't realize I did that. All right, so what is the bare necessities to actually creating a module? There are two, two files, uh, the name of your module.info and the name of your module.module. .module. What Drupal does is it scans the site's directory recursively looking for .info files. It reads them and then, um, based on the information contained in them, displays those modules on your modules page. Uh, so the, really the bare necessity to have something show up on that modules page is the .info file. So what goes in the info file? This is an example. Um, we have the name, which is going to show up on your list, and description that just appears directly below it, the version of Drupal that this module is targeting. Uh, the package is a, you know, how they're grouped according to um, purpose, like we'll have UI and we'll have CCK, et cetera. That's what the package is. And a little tip if you're doing module development is to go ahead and start your package name with a Z so it'll float all the way to the bottom, make it easier to find. Um, excuse me, dependencies, that's exactly what it sounds like. If your module has requirements for other modules to be enabled, you can specify them here and uh, Drupal will dis disallow you to enable a module from enabling the module until these dependencies are met. It also is instructional to Drush 3 and 4 to download those modules and request. Um, now the module, dot module file is a lot more, oh this is, if you want more information about the info file. The module, dot module file contains a lot more information. This is all of the, the actual module content. And we're going to go ahead and build that. There are two other files that you probably don't have to concern yourself with when getting started. There's a dot install file, which read by default by Drupal when the module is first enabled. The reason you'd have this in a separate file is you don't go enabling and disabling files or modules all the time, and so it seems redundant to include that code. So this is where you would set up your schema definitions for tables that you create, or um, set up variables and delete variables when the module's uninstalled. Um, you would also put your messages to users for instructions on what to do after they've enabled the module here. Uh, and .inc files are just includes that are, are loaded on demand. So you would, you would do Drupal um, I forget what module load, I can't recall. call. There's an API call that loads the include files on demand. All right, so um, the module development process is make sure you really need the module because it's not going to be as short a process as you might think. Make sure somebody else didn't already do it. Research the hooks you need. Research the API calls. And then see if another module can fulfill part of that responsibility for you so that you don't have to go all the way up for yourself. And lastly get started. All right, so now that you know roughly the framework, um, you can get an idea of how these modules do their thing. So for example, automatic node titles, it catches the node, uh, the hook node, and when a node is saved, it checks for whatever rules you've set to change the title, saves the node again. CAPTCHA does a hook form alter, r uh, responds to that on a specific form ID, and adds the CAPTCHA to it. Um, Menu block, what does menu block do? Oh, well it creates a, menu, a block out of a menu, so you can see how that might be done. Uh, if you are migrating modules from six to seven, this is a useful uh, URL. I'll go ahead and mark that up a little later. And um, this is a module to check whether or not uh, you are uh, adhering to the conventions and standards of Drupal um, coding practices. So Coder will call you out on things like um, not using the T function or not using Drupal set message with clean um, text, sanitized text. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started with the module.
Can't we get out of this? There we go. All right, so um, any of the modules you create, you're going to put them under the Sites All Modules folder. Uh, there's a useful convention to put contrib modules in a contrib folder and your custom modules in a custom module folder. Drupal will still find them wherever they are, but the advantage of separating them out is that it's much easier to find them when you're trying to fix something that's bringing the site down. All right, so we're going to create our Hello module. You know what, I think I'm actually just going to start from built and walk you through it. Oops. Oops. So the first thing we'll do, oops, we're just going to create a module called Hello Drupal. ID, name, package, description. It's one of those things that works until you demo it. Huh. Weird. Okay. So anybody catch the latest episode of Walking Dead? <laughs> I heard the last comic book issue was pretty intense. <laughs> that's a that's a one of those shows that catches you by surprise. Um, I'm not sure what I did wrong there. The module shows up now. Oops. So we have it under the name of Hello Drupal, description demonstration module for a few hooks, and the package we're using ZZZ Drupal Summit for the reasons I uh, said before. So uh, here it goes, it shows up on the um, module listing page. There's our, our name, there's our description. I have the coder module installed, so it gives me the opportunity to do a code review on it. Um, I'm not going to enable it just yet. Let's see here. I 
anybody know a color scheme that's not uh, so hard to read? Uh, anybody know a Vim color scheme that's not hard to read? No? Quickly look this up. There, is that easier to read? All right, so um, here's an example of a hook that we're, we're creating an instance for, the enable hook. The first time you enable your, your uh, function or your module, it's gonna call hook enable and, uh, in that module. It knows which hook to call because your module is named hello, and so it's just looking for hello underscore enable. So in this case, once I enable the module, I want a message to pop up saying don't forget to place the block. Let's go ahead and do the same. Look at module. Yeah, that's readable. All right, so let's go ahead and enable it. So there's our message that popped up the first time we enabled the module. If I disable and enable the module again, it'll pop up again. So um, now I'll go ahead and look at our implementation of hook menu. Again, uh, Drupal, when it first enables a module and every time you visit the modules page, will scan the, um, the dot module files looking for hooks of interest. One of those hooks of interest is menu. Another one is block. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to rebuild the menu registry um, so in this case, we're interested in responding to admin slash settings slash hello. When we get a request for that URL, we want to call our, um, our uh, form to be generated. So in this case, we have a form generation function called hello settings page. So let me give you an example of that nasty form array. This is a, our form generation function. We can just create a, a blank array, initialize it to nothing. This will be the variable that's gonna be stored in the variables table. This is a description of the field element, default value, whether or not it's required, and the rest of this should be straightforward. There is a form API page for details on what those are in particular. <coughs> this return system settings form, this is a special function in Drupal for settings pages. It takes care of a lot of the work that you'd normally do to process a form and saves these functions in the variables table for you. So you don't have to do anything special to, to get the information back out. So what do we use for our URL? Admin settings hello. So there's our form. We have a welcome back hello. Wait, that's not right. We'd like it to say, um, welcome message. This is the description. And this is the default text. Hello, username. There's the title, default, blah, blah, blah. You guys getting the idea there? All right, so now. Hello admin, welcome back. So let's go ahead and go through this um, module to figure out how that's uh, all accomplished. We have um, a implementation of the user hook. So when the user logs in, I check the operation to make sure that it's a login because in, again in D6, this, this function's called for login, log out, delete, create. So uh, check to make sure it's a login. If it is, then I get the um, variable out of the variables table that we saved at our settings page. And if there's not one, I have a default of hello username. Uh, I replace my pseudo token, this just PHP for string replacement. And then I do a Drupal set message and exit out of the function. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so we wanna go that step further and make sure that the, nobody except a user with appropriate permissions has access to this page. 
The way that we'll do that is we'll define a permission. So here's that hook perm. This is called by Drupal when it de generates the permissions table. We define a permission called access hello module settings. Uh, what is it? And there's our permission. We can now assign that to users, uh, to roles and um, uh, accordingly. So then we can assign the roles back to the users. So now we have full control over who has access to that settings page, uh, at least within the permissions table. When you actually get to the form, we have these access arguments in the menu saying that only people who pass the um, access check will have access to, with this permission, will have access to this menu entry. So if they don't pass this, uh, access check, that menu entry won't even show up. They won't have the ability to access. It'll show 403 is forbidden. Um, so we also talked about creating a block that showed the amount of time that they've actually been logged in. So we'll go to the blocks page. And here's our block that we created. Let's go ahead and put it in the left sidebar on the top here. You've been log you logged in two minutes and 33 seconds ago. So we do that using um, the, another hook implementation, in this case block. We're gonna uh, catch the operations for list and for view. List is the operation that uh, tells Drupal which blocks you're going to be generating for display and gives you information about them. This is the information that's used to generate that block listing page. View as, uh, actually displays the block. Uh, the delta is a, a key that you use and you can generate any, use anything you like for the key. It can be text, number, numerical, etc. So that if your module creates more than one block, you can bring up the appropriate block accordingly. So I use um, hello welcome as the key. And then I call a function to populate the contents of it. And you see that we'll use that global user uh, object to find out when the user logged in last. That's a Unix time, so we format, use an API call to format the interval so that it looks pretty. And we return the text that's going to appear in the block. All right. That is the Drupal 6 module. I have a Drupal 7 module I'll go through next, unless you guys want to stop and go through um, how the pieces fit together again. Does anybody have any questions? All right. All right, so the menu function works exactly the same way as it did before. Nothing's changed between D6 and 7. Here we've pulled the info section out of that hook block, and now it's its own function. Uh, block view, now that's its own function. We still rely on the delta to know which block we're delivering. Uh, it's no longer hook user, now it's user login because we only care about the login operation. The permissions work the same, except that we now have the opportunity to define a description of the permission that will appear in place of and or in addition to the title or, or the permission name itself. And the settings page works exactly the same. So uh, the generation of the Drupal 7 module from the Drupal 6 uh, in this case um, was relatively straightforward. You can actually get the coder module to do it for you because uh, it'll recognize things like the switches that you use to specify which operation you're acting on and it'll pull them out for you. So if you're migrating a D6 to D7 module, start with the coder. System. All right, so we talked about um, we talked about uh, the framework. We talked about the hook system, and then we showed you an implementation of how the hooks work and fit together. I 
go to that last page about the modules. Um, should have just gone backwards from the first. Uh, all right, so for menu block, does anybody have an, uh, any idea how we would put that together if we were to implement something like that? Any hooks that you would implement to create a menu block? So what menu block does as a module is that it takes a menu that exists in the system and it uh, uh, formats it as a nested array or as a nested li um, tag and then spits it out as a block. So um, there's at least one hook that suggests itself. Yeah, hook block, yeah. Uh, and then you'd use the framework to pull out the menu entries for the particular menu of interest. Um, CAPTCHA, uh, I briefly mentioned it, that's hook form alter. And what that does is you can um, get the form ID for any form on the website and create a form alter function for it. You implement the callback for it so that you can modify it. An example of something that uh, I use frequently for hook form alter is the login blocks on Drupal allow the saving of uh, login credentials and that apparently is a PC guide compliance issue. So you have to add the uh, no save tag, whatever it has to be. So you can use hook form alter to modify the login form so that you can be PCI compliant instead of having to modify template files throughout the site and then if somebody changes the theme, you're, you're starting from square one. Um, another example of hook form alter that you might need is say that you have a content type that has fields that are um, generally available but um, one or two fields that you don't want users of a certain role to have access to. There is a module called content permissions but I consider that to be a little heavy and unwieldy for something as simple as hiding one or two fields. Hook form alter will allow you to set those fields as invisible on a per role basis. Relatively straightforward. Um, another use for hook form alter is adding a uh, widget. Say that you want your um, integer fields to show up as a slider. You can add HTML markup. It will pop up right afterwards. And that way you can do it in code rather than a theme layer. So that, if, again, if they change the theme, your, your content goes with it. Um, hook user, that's uh, if you want to keep track of when somebody tr attempts to change their login, change passwords, and you want to impose restrictions on how often they can do that. If you want to impose restrictions on how long they've gone without changing their password, hook user you can just respond to on login or log out and post messages or send emails. Um, at every step in the process, at the various things that Drupal does, and I'll say for example sending out an email, when an email is generated, if you use the Drupal mail function, uh, every module that implements the um, hook mail uh, callback has an opportunity to modify that mail before it gets sent out. So um, the, it, in general, if you find that there's a part of the website that you want to modify before it gets seen by the user, there's a hook for that. Um, that's a common uh, uh, Drupal developer mantra. <laughs> there's a hook for that. Um, some contrib modules provide their own hooks. CCK provides a number of hooks. Views provides a number of hooks um, that allow you to modify the view before it gets presented to the user. An example of a hook that uh, you might use for views is that you might want to um, do some operations on the argument before it gets passed into the view, or you might want to hide or show filters dependent upon the context. There are other ways to do that, but that's not an example use. Um, Let's see, what else is there? Automatic node titles. I think I hinted at how that was done before. Does anybody have a concept of how we might have done that? Which hook we might use? It would be um, in Drupal 6, it would be hook node API. In Drupal 7, it would be hook node load. And um, you'd use node load and node save to modify the, the, the thing. Uh, so any questions about details in particular? And can I show some example of something you'd like to see? Because if there's something that you'd like me to add to the module, I can do that really quickly. Okay, let's say, let's say you had a, uh, some content that you wanted somebody with a search permission to be able to see, but anonymous user could only see three fields out of five. Yeah. 
you, Yeah, there is a module called field permissions, and that is what it does. Um, I find that module a little unwieldy because when you enable it, you have to control every field that you create for every content type. And so, it, you know, you can do the same thing with a, a node load or a node, I think it's preview, um, so that you can modify what's in the node before it's presented to the theme layer. As long as you've got access to it before it's sent to the theme layer, you can control what the user sees. And you can ch use that user access framework API call to find out whether or not they have the permissions. And you can generate your own permissions using that hook perm. So say that you wanted to limit access to these three fields based on a certain combination of those three fields, or those three permissions. You'd create a callback for hook perm, define the three permissions of interest. You'd create a hook node load or hook node preview, I think it is. And you would... Um, check the node and check the content type to make sure it was the content type of interest, check the user's access levels depending, based on your particular user logic, and then uh, either remove those variables from the array or put them somewhere else. Yeah. Or you might replace them with content saying, such as you don't have access to view this. Now whether or not it's the correct way to do it depends on your use case, but yeah. Anybody else with a particular need? Well, there are a lot of um, gotchas when it comes to module development. As I said, the, uh, the um, user uh, uh, global uh, object or user array is, um, is the active user. So if you modify the UID of the user object, and say if I did a global user down here and then I'd set user dash ID equals one, suddenly that user has an admin privileges from that point forward. Um, because, well, for that request. Uh, so that's why con by convention, if you're going to be doing modifications to a user account, uh, you want to copy the user, clone the user into a variable called a, a account, make your modifications, and then do a, node, a user save on it. Um, what else is there? And when you're doing module development, a very useful module is called Devel. What Devel allows you to do is it uh, provides two, f two or three functions. One of, one of the most useful is BPM, which is basically a pretty print for function for variables. It'll print the objects out and it'll print the, matter of fact, I'll show you. Now this is gonna crash right now because BPM's not, or Devel's not enabled. So I'm going to go ahead and download the Devel module. I'll go ahead and enable it. Let's see if it's enabled yet. That block is probably set to cache. Nope. Oh, silly me, I'm in the D7 folder. So DPM will allow you to print out the variables while you're working on them, give you a good idea of what's in them. This is a good idea to do because then you can see how the user object looks. I have to download Devel again because it was on the wrong site. just determined not to let me do that, isn't it? How do I 
Oh, that's for logging. Wrong place. So here's an example of the user object for admin. Okay, you get access to the UID of the user, the name of the user. This is the hashed pass that's actually stored in the database, their email address. You see how all of this information might be useful for generating um, uh, logic to mod work based on the user who's logged in. This data um, field is actually for storage of serialized data of your, of your own discretion. Um, it's not generally used because if you were to fill that up, it would slow the, the user indexing down. Uh, this uh, login time is the time that you're logged in. That's what we use for the block over here. So in addition to devel, uh, you recall that I had to generate that form array. Well, this form array, if you're building a large form, can quickly become kind of cumbersome. For example, right here, we're building a single field, and it's, what is that, 10 lines of code? If you want to generate anything resembling a large, a, um, a decent sized form, you're going to be putting in 15 uh, field elements. It's about 120 lines of code just to spit out a form. There is a module available. Uh, form builder. So if you enable the form builder module, it gives you a uh, display like this that allows you to drag and drop and create the form. When you're done, you click export and it spits out the PHP that you would need to generate this. That's in the ra rapid module development side of things. Now, the, another thing that speeds things up is if your module defines a content type, generates any views, creates permissions, image cache profiles, um, and these are all things that tend to go with you, uh, writing the code to create all that is rather cumbersome and error prone, so the faster way to do it is to use features. So you would enable the features module, collect all of the exportable content that's related to your module, uh, generate the feature, download it, create an include file for your code, and then add the line to include the include. Now that would give you the opportunity to leverage everything features brings to the table, which is to say, if you need to make a quick change to a view, you just do it through the pull the lever method, uh, re-roll the feature, and uh, re-include your include file. And, and you don't have to worry about whether or not you missed a semicolon in the, in the content type import. Um, what else is there? Anything else? <laughs> well, I was a little faster than I expected. I should have taken more time. Well, um, let's see, is there anything else you guys want to go over? Create content. The, um, the site for reference that you'll be using is api.drupal.org or drupalcontrib.org. And uh, default's to server now, which really takes the heck out of me. But if you wanted to look up a function, for example, the L function that uh, wraps the links, it gives you the, the parameters and arguments and return values you need. Good? All right then. Well, then I finished early. You guys have some time to kill. <laughs> uh, unless people have questions. So, again, sorry for rushing through things. Uh, I thought that the module development side of things would take a little longer. All right. Much appreciated for you guys coming out. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. A book? There's a book called uh, Professional Drupal Development, uh, and that is practically the Bible because it's organized, well organized and structured according to the kinds of things that you'd be looking to build. Um, it's the only book I've found out that I keep on my shelf. Um, there's a new version out for Drupal 7. There were a lot of errata in it when I had a copy. It was things like uh, misspelling node. <laughs> so. Uh, um, watch out for that, but other than that, it's an excellent reference. Pro Drupal development.
Yeah, in terms of module development, really the hardest thing to get a hang of is, is how the hooks get called and, uh, and what to actually put in the module.info and module.module .module files. Once you've got an idea of where to look for the hook callbacks and, and uh, where your reference material is, all that from that point forward is just Google. So, um, I think I'll take down unless anybody else has a question. No? That's my son, by the way. <laughs> yeah, drove uh, three hours out of Atlanta to get here, so I'm going to head right back to him. I have another presentation on views and panels in uh, uh, about an hour, so if you guys are looking for um, another reason to sleep. <laughs> um, aside from me rushing through it, was the content good? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I worried a little bit about trying to fit everything in, and so I tried to rush through it a little. So. Yeah, I don't like building the form arrays. I use that form builder pretty much entirely. Yeah. Uh, Drupal 7 adds some new things where you can add markup to it. Like, um, it's more convenient to add markup. Yeah. There's a lot more theming flexibility in D7. Yeah, a lot more flexibility. Um, the database um, system that they've got in D7, though, I'm not sure is a good approach. Have it, has anybody looked at it? So previously, I mean, you'd, you'd generate your queries directly. You'd call them with DB query and DB result. These are the API calls available for you to call the, um, the database. It was uh, uh, abstracted, so you know, whatever, no matter what's running underneath it, it would run the SQL against it, but you still had to make sure your SQL was cross-platform uh, compliant. Uh, now it's uh, object-based, so... What about this? I can help with I like that. It. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did I this? You gave me a I good found idea. How do you do that? that? It's like this. Well, I disagree. Well, I disagree. Let's put the word out. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you.